Hello there everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Joe if you've not been here before and today I'm very pleased to be able to bring you some Opus 7 highlights for Final Fantasy Training Card Game. Now the last couple of weeks have been extremely crazy for me. So the first weekend obviously I did Euros and I gave you guys a vlog about that which you guys can check it wasn't too long ago in my videos. And then this weekend just gone I was at London Comic Con uh, demonstrating the game and being basically an ambassador for the game and it was manic, it was crazy and I managed to get, obviously I believe that we got a lot of new players into so I'm really hoping that this video is going to reach a lot of you guys who have only just started playing the game and we were actually demonstrating the heroes versus villains uh, dual deck and honestly I'm going to do a separate video on that uh, on that deck because I think it's just so magnificent and so well designed that I think everybody needs to know about it but this is going to be very similar to some of the other videos that I've done all the way since Opus 1 I'm going to pick four highlights from each element so that the video doesn't go on for hours and hours and hours and give you reasons as to why I believe you should be focusing on some of these cards. So we're going to get started with Fire. Now the first card that I'm going to mention very very quickly before I actually go into any detail with anything is Jekt. I've actually spoken about Jekt a few times in the past and I do actually really really like the card and I definitely think it's going to see play. Uh, I think there's it's really really good and it opens up a lot of possibilities for Fire to start running for Sawyer and Sin as which we'll get to a lot later. But the first card I actually want to make any focus on is the other legend that's for Fire in the set and that's Larn. Now Larn is a really really high value forward that you know, can clear boards very, very quickly if your opponent isn't careful. And this is kind of the direction I'm really glad that Fire is taking because I think it's going to work really well for it. It's a really high value forward because the card that it asks for in order to gain a thousand power is actually his searcher from Opus One. And this kind of synergy is exactly what Fire needed. If you go back and watch my Mono Fire video, then you'll see that um, consistency is something that I really had an issue with. So I'm really, really pleased to see that coming forward here. And then two things to quickly note with Lan before moving on to the next card is if you um, use his ability then he is technically dealing damage to a forward so you can always chain his ability off of himself and that's really really powerful and the other thing is that you actually only have to activate Lan's ability on resolution so therefore once the damage has been dealt you then choose at the latest possible time which is the best possible time for you to whether you want to use that ability or not. Now the next card I want to talk about is Lulu. Now Lulu I actually really really like in very much the same vein as Miyun from a previous set. I think that she's a 2 CP backup that you don't necessarily want to play too early but I think if you're playing fire and anything or any kind of searches really then playing Lulu allows you to kind of play these I enter the field effects but then don't do anything afterwards backups, but then make use of them in a really interesting and cool way. And because she's fire, she doesn't necessarily clash with the Lulu that often gets run in lightning in order to buff all of your lightning forwards, so there's no clash there. So I actually really do think that Lulu is a very, very good card. Now there's a new mechanic in the Opus 7 with monsters across the board where they are, there's one in every colour where you can discard the card from your hand just to get a free effect and the first one I want to talk about is Bomb. Now this Bomb, first of all I want to note on the artwork because all of the artworks for these particular monsters is beautiful and I love it. Um, but this Bomb in particular is really really strong for kind of just dealing that extra bit of damage. We've, we've been used to running forwards that do things like Furion from Opus 1 or Furion again from the dual deck where you get that extra chip damage. Zelda is another example after you've gone into combat and I think that bomb just being able to add that 2k extra is actually really relevant and then the fact that you get um, when it's on the board a spread damage effect that's been very very popular in fire decks recently as well means that it's actually quite versatile so I really, I really do quite like bomb now the uh, the last card I want to talk about for fire is actually technically two cards so I might be cheating a little bit but it's Aegis and Sol and honestly I cannot wait to see the Warrior of Light decks start to come out of the woodwork when it comes to fire. Honestly, if any card got buffed from this set that was from a previous set, it's Light Wall. Because that card is going to do some scary things in the future between Aegis, Sol, Warrior of Light from the dual deck, the power buffers from Opus 5, the Warriors of Light from Final Fantasy 3 that is, War um, Warrior of Light from the dual deck again, there's, there's actually a really, really strong consistency play within fire now and they all do really really interesting things and Aegis being able to give wall brave is actually a lot lot stronger than you think because the whole point of wall is to die so if you're just throwing wall at your opponent and then getting free damage there's gonna have to come a point where your opponent's gonna have to deal with your wall and honestly that I think is just a really valuable thing in and of itself and then soul comes along as well and is a super valuable um, forward if you have any other Warrior of Light that can be triggered by Aegis or Wall 
and you just get this nicely beefy guy out of the process. And I think that honestly, whether it be fire, water, fire, wind, or fire, earth, I think there's definitely a deck there for Warrior of Light and I cannot wait to see it. I will hopefully be building one myself. Moving into ice now. Now I know that ice gets a lot of you know, love and hate relationship when it comes to this game, but the first card I want to talk about here is one that I'm really, really happy to be showing, and it's actually one that I spoiled during Euros, and it made me very happy to be the person to be able to show it, but this is Laswell from Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. As a Brave Exvius fan, it's really, really cool to have this card in the game, and we have confirmation that Brave Exvius is getting full support in Opus 8, so people have that to look forward to as well. But, he might be the only Brave Exvius card in the set, but what a card he is! Dealing that much damage to a dull forward in uh, for 2 CP? This card is essentially Ice's equivalent to VV, and that is a scary thought in and of itself. You cannot attack safely in the, with early game pressure with this last well. Now, the thing is, is the, the funny thing is, is that this counters the most recent build of Ice very, very well, in that Turbo Discard has very, very weak forwards. So, if you're able to then just kill them off by playing your own guy, you have a counterplay to that deck in a different ice deck. Whether that was he played in Turbo Discard and we end up with a problem of, you know, the best counter to a deck is itself, I don't know. But I think that honestly this is better suited to mid-range ice anyway, because obviously the more ice characters you have out, the stronger Laswell becomes. So I actually think the Laswell's going to see a lot of play. One card that I do think is going to be seeing a lot of play in Turbo Discard, however, is Gremlin. Gremlin is... Well, exactly that, actually. He's a little demon. He's horrible. He's a 2CP monster that triggers and turns into a four. This is another archetype that's been introduced into the game that triggers after you, a certain trigger for, in this case, your opponent discarding card, and then they become a forward that's a lot more valuable than the cost you put into them. It's not hard for a turbo discard deck to discard a card out of your opponent's hand. So having Gremlin come out and essentially be a setzer for 2CP is quite scary. Um, you know, I'd, whether... It, to be honest, I could be completely wrong. It could be that the Gremlin might be too slow for the deck, but honestly, on first impressions, and you do have to remember that this is all a first impressions video, that he looks terrifying. Now, a card I know that has been spoken about a lot with the lead up to Opus 7 is Snow. And Snow is a 4 CP backup, and that in and of itself is detrimental to the card, certainly in a colour that's as proactive as Ice is. However, it does have that kind of nice avenue that Earth Wall had in, in Earth, where you do technically get the ability the turn you play it, because as long as you play it and then attack with something, you're not going to play Snow with no back, with no forwards out, unless you have to. So I actually do think the card is very, very good, though I don't think it's the be-all and end-all that other people seem to think it is, and one card that I would highly suggest people start looking out for, certainly with Wind, who has gotten a hell of a buff in this set, is Legendary Aerith, because it means that Snow is not going to do anything to you. I will quickly go over one of the summons in this set, which is the Ice one, which is Shiva. Honestly, I'm quite, like, I find that a lot of the summons in this set are quite lacklustre, but honestly, this one you are only going to run for its EX, EX burst, but if that EX burst goes off, it is devastating. Dulling and freezing two guys, I mean, we've seen two CP Shiva see a lot of play, for, and it just dulls two guys. Playing it from your hand is not great, but you do also have to remember that by being named Shiva, it can buff the Final Fantasy XIII Shiva from, I believe, Opus 4, that deals more damage depending on how many Shivas are in your break zone. I'm not sure this one is going to see play because we have so many good Shivas already, but it's worth noting that that EX burst is really, really strong. But the last card I want to talk about here is Sephiroth. Now, when people saw Sephiroth, I think people kind of bust a nut, and so everyone was like, oh my god, more discard, oh my god. However, you have to kind of look at it from a value perspective. He is 7 CP, and he is only 8k. Yes, you're going to have to discard two cards, but that is only taking 4 CP away from you. So you, it does kind of even out, and he ends up slightly above the curve, which isn't the worst thing in the world. However, I do really like the card as an alternative to Orphan in, in other ice decks, because Orphan is obviously restricted to mono ice, because you're required to have five ice characters for him to have his full potential. But maybe in an Earth ice deck where you have access to Jesse, which can then search out Sephiroth or Genesis, or any of the Earth of their Final Fantasy VII characters, um, or you know, you get access to a lot of different things. It's I just think that he's okay. I think that he's quite good. I maybe he maybe I'm wrong and maybe he's broken and maybe everyone's going to play him. But I do see him more as an alternative to Orphan than anything else because in mid range ice you're probably going to run Orphan over this. Um, but in, you're not going to run three Orphan and three of this guy because then it's a six CP unit, a seven CP unit, and it's just not going to pan out very well. You're not going to be able to pay for it all. And then, but I do think that maybe dual-coloured decks would use this. 
Moving into Wind now. Now, I think Wind has got some fantastic cards this set. And the first one I want to talk about is Chalinka. Now, Chalinka is just a very, very interesting... In fact, it's not just Chalinka I want to talk about in general. It's the whole Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles engine. So that's Chalinka, Yuri, who we'll get to later when we talk about light cards, and Alhanalem, and then the Searcher as well. There's just a lot of really nice synergies for Mono Winds to go off of here. And then... Chalinka being able to deal extra damage from any Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles character I think is really really nice and then the you know being a on-curve unit that deals spread damage when she comes in Another thing that I think might start seeing play very very soon is old Minwoo again because there's a lot of chip damage in this For Sawyer is obviously very very relevant There's a lot of reasons for Minwoo to see play again or at least even possibly I believe uh, you know There was a card in Opus 4 that was a similar card to Minwoo But I think it was Flintlock was the name of the card where you had to dull it and it only gets you know, stopped one of your guys from taking damage, but it was 2 CP, so it's a turn one play, so maybe that will start seeing play. But I think the combo potential in Mono Wind is definitely there for Al Hanalem and Chalinka and Yuri, because you have so many ways of reactivating your backups. It's very, very, you know, Balthea fits perfectly in the theme with this as well. It's just there's a lot of really, really nice synergies between the Crystal Chronicles cards, and you could even delve into Fire if you wanted to and start playing Latov, so you could start resurrecting them if you need to. Vata, which is one of the forwards from Final Fantasy Legends, or Dimensions as it's known other than, um, outside of the US, is value on a stick. Like, he's just extremely valuable. If you know, You're only ever going to play him in one deck, which is going to be Mono Wind, realistically. Because if you, if you play for him with Wind CP, you're going to activate all of your Wind backups. So you're not realistically going to play him in anything other than Mono Wind, but he's so valuable in that colour. I mean, if you're playing Ark and Maria, you're playing a 10,000 guy for free, and then the backups all come back again. You could use Ark's ability if you wanted to, to make it so that a guy was harder to block. There's um, synergies with Alhanalem, like I mentioned earlier, where you're dealing extra damage to things. Uh, Alhanalem, I'll quickly mention now, as I've spoken about, he is good with the Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles engine, and I think there's a lot of capabilities for him to do a lot of damage very, very quickly, whether it be Water Wind, uh, fire wind, earth wind, or just mono wind, but obviously you have to have the other two guys in the in the deck or at least have one of them out for you to be able to do anything with them. So it's quite fragile, but I do think it's still going to be really, really powerful. But Vata, if you're playing mono wind, goes in the deck. It's just very, very valuable and there's not a lot of reason not to run it. Now Zoo, similarly to Bomb and some of the other cards in the set, has this straight up discard for an effect. However, it's actually his, his you know, on the field effect that I really, really like because you're essentially playing Zoo early so that you can then stockpile CP for later where you're, you know, you're playing it and you're not going to use it straight away. But it, it, it reminds me a lot of Liak, but it, I think it's a more aggressive play than Liak because you choose when to activate it and you're activating all of your backups. So, for example, for Sawyer is very, very popular right now. Even just by discarding Zoo from your hand, you're going to get two uses of for Sawyer. And yes, you're going to take two damage with it, but then maybe you're playing Fire Wind and you're playing Jekt in the deck and that's actually a good thing for you. So I do think that Zoo has a lot of potential for massive combo play, so I definitely watch out for Zoo. Now going into Earth, another card that wears the Warrior of Light mantle that I actually really like in this in this set is Kryl. Now I really liked Kryl back in Opus 3 when she was just, you know, she had like crazy combo plays back then. She's a little bit sort of like gimmicky now, but this Kryl is just solid across the board. I really like the fact that she has such good synergies with a summon deck, maybe in Earth Water, you're running Garnet, or you're running, you know, something like Graviton as well. She synergizes very well with that. And being a Warrior of Light, you can, ha you know, she's on curve as well at 8k for 4 CP. So playing things like Aegis or Warrior, Light Warrior of Light, so she takes less damage, I think that's going to be a really, really strong play. I've said it once and I said with Fire, and I'll say it again, I honestly believe that Warrior of Light as an archetype is going to be a very, very relevant thing. And I don't, uh, just because of the sheer amount of value you get. Light Warrior of Light's ability to not take, to take 2,000 less damage across the board is a straight counter to the meta right now with Fasoya being as popular as it is, with Valafor being as popular as it is, with the Crystal Chronicles engine potentially being as popular as it is. Warrior of Light kind of negates every single one of those things, so I definitely watch out for him. And then another card that I wanted to mention was Carbuncle. Now, whenever I build an Earth deck, I often find myself kind of having to pick and choose between a lot of different 2CP backups, whether it be Monk, Kate Sith, Doga, stuff like that. 
but I actually really like this card because I think that it allows you to kind of bluff play your opponent and just kind of go, oh, at the end of your turn, I'm going to quickly slap this carbuncle down so I have more for the next turn. Not only that, but if you're going second, this card is the perfect card to be in your opening hand because you're drawing the extra card and you're starting with a backup before you've actually started doing anything. So I really like carbuncle. And then I also really had to mention Asmodai. Now, Asmodai as a forward obviously looks a little bit under the curve, but you have to read his text and realize how much value that has. It doesn't ask you for any particular cost that he has to break. It, it, all it asks is that it's dull. So I think that, you know, your opponent's going to dull a forward at some point. It's just, unless every single forward in their deck has Brave, they're going to be dying a forward at some point. So Asmodee's value is just extremely powerful. So I think that having f removal on a forward in Earth is actually really, really helpful to it. Earth already has some of the best forwards in the game, like Earth Wall and Dadaluma, and I actually would put this card, you know, I, I'm not, I would put it pretty close to those guys actually, just because of the sheer amount of value and disruption that he causes. And then I couldn't not mention Noctis, because I think that he goes very, very well in a Fasoya based deck, although I've been experimenting with Earthwater for a while as an anti-meta play to Turbo Discard, but with Turbo Discard getting slightly less popular and the, you know, potential popularity of Warrior of Light coming back, I'm not sure how strong that deck is going to be in the current, or in the Opus 7 meta, but I want to see Noctis C play because he's Noctis, but one bit of advice that I would try and give to everybody is while it's really cool that Noctis is in the game, and yes, he is quite a good card, don't allow your fandom for him to blindside you and make you play him in situations that you shouldn't. Now in Lightning, uh, there's another monster archetype that I really like that's been coming forward in this set, and that's the monster forwards from World of Final Fantasy. So that's Zapt, uh, Babliz, and Frizz, which are Baby, Shiva, Ramu, and Ifrit. The reason that I wanted to bring the Lightning one up in particular is because I think Ramu is such a good card for Lightning, this is the 3 CP Ramu from Opus 6, that having a searcher for it, that's also pull, be, you're also able to pull back through Urianje in certain decks. Maybe this build you know, elevates Scions quite nicely. I think that it's really, really cool to see something so versatile and like you want the card to die, but you can use it as leverage towards your opponent. You could run it, run it into your opponent, have um, Zapt die, search for Ramu, and then deal the blocker 7,000 damage afterwards while doing something else. I think the Zapt is actually a very, very dangerous card. And then Gilgamesh I know is a really, really popular card, and I think he's very, very cool. I personally think the best way to run him is like a lightning version of Opus 1 Vanille, where he's just a persistent forward that won't go away. But I think that there is potential for maybe an Earth Lightning deck to come around that uses maybe Gipple or Opus 1 Kefka to make it so that he's 10,000 power, so that he can have Brave and Attack twice. But I think loading like 9 to 12 copies of Gilgamesh in your deck is probably not a good idea and I don't think that he's strong enough to sort of stand on his own. You have to have quite a lot of external stimuli in order to make him into what he wants to be but I do think that the card has potential I'm just I want to people be cautious when they run this card. Seymour is very very good in opening for Sawyer up past water decks. In water lightning it's just a straight staple it's ephemeral summoner but it's in lightning instead of water, so therefore it opens that archetype up like a great amount so that you could then run, say, lightning fire for Soya. And you know, you might not run as many copies of him, but being able to stack EX bursts on top of your deck is actually quite powerful regardless. So I really, really like Seymour. And then finally, X Death is an interesting one because he's a backup that can pull things out from either player's break zone, which is an unheard of mechanic up until now. However, the reason that I want to, that I do like him, probably only as a one-of in most in any lightning deck, he'll only really go on mono lightning as well, because I think that lightning is very, very good at wanting to get to five backups regardless. But obviously with X Death wanting to be the fifth backup, I think that that kind of throws a wrench in the works. But you know, Idea is obviously wanting to have five lightning backups out as quickly as possible. And if X Death is your fourth or fifth backup, he's still able to pull out things like Amon or Zemus. So I think the value is definitely potentially there. But I just think that you're going to want to run one, one of him at most, I would, I would say. Now, Water also plays into the Warrior of Light mechanic in Dusk. Now, Dusk is a really interesting card when paired up with Light Wall. If you have um, Dusk, 
and uh, Warrior of Light from the starter deck in your break zone, you have the potential to do either offensive or defensive plays depending on what you need Wall to do. So if you have a Warrior of Light other than Dusk, you can draw a card off of it. The summon, the summon gimmick on Dusk I don't think is that great. I think that you're probably only going to want to run one of him, maybe two. And then that way you're just getting a bit of consistency out of the, the engine for um, Wall because if you've played Wall for 4 CP, grabbed a Warrior of Light from the top of your deck reducing his CP by 2, and then he's died and you've pulled back a 3 CP guy that's drawn you a card, the value you've gotten out of that Wall is ridiculous. So I definitely want to keep an eye on Dusk. Then the other cards I wanted to mention uh, are both versions of Tidus, actually. The reason I like Legendary Tidus, despite the fact that he is quite so... Um, mitigated by his uh, restriction on how you can play him, I think the threat of Tidus is actually stronger than Tidus himself. For example, if I'm going to sit there at the end of my turn playing a mono water deck and I've got three water backups available, you're going to be hesitant to attack me thinking, oh, maybe he's got a Tidus in his hand. That, you know, you could not even play him and he could be in your deck. Obviously, if you get to a top card in a tournament, it's going to be pretty revealed that you're not going to have a Tidus in your deck. But by that point, you should already know what your deck is doing. You, but you can make the bluff plays against unsuspecting players. But even if you and if you do play Tidus, you only have to play maybe one of him because you're only going to have to play him once, and that's going to strike the fear of God into somebody attacking you. And I really like that. But then the other Tidus from Pictologica I really like as well because he shares a colour with things like Viking and Layla, which are already massive advantage generators but he's got a dirty grey body on him while he's doing it, and I think it's really, really cool. So I definitely want to keep an eye on both copies of Tidus. They are both Guardians, but honestly, I'm not a big fan of the Guardian deck. I think that, honestly, they're trying too hard to do the Gullwing thing, and Kimari's too easily removed. So honestly, the whole kind of archetype falls down a little bit as long as Kimari's gone, and Kimari requires too much other too many things other than him going on for me to really love the deck but if you're a massive Final Fantasy X fan then go out and prove me wrong and show me an amazing Guardian deck because I'd like to see it and then the last card I want to mention for water actually is Halicarnassus I actually think that Halicarnassus is really really powerful on the ability to both you know be removal for water which we don't see a lot of the cost on it is very very heavy like the just to discard two summons but there are summons in water that are less useful sometimes than others for example if you're running water and you already have like cycle through all your fasoys etc your pew pews aren't going to be as useful if you're against an ice deck your leviathan decks aren't going to be as useful so it gives an alternate use to those and removing all of your opponent's forwards abilities for a turn means that things like emperor aren't going to hamper you anywhere nearly as badly as it could do and i do think the halicarnassus is actually a really really strong card i also really really like the character and i like the artwork and the fact that it says queen as a job quickly going over the light and dark cards of the set the first one we're going to talk about is going to be Yuna. Now, I'll be honest, I don't particularly like this Yuna. I think that she's kind of unnecessary. I think the main reason for this Yuna to exist is to allow you to play YRP from Opus 1 outside of Wind Water, because the only water part of that was Yuna, so now that you have a light version, you could take them and Valor for out of that kind of shoebox and then kind of open it up a little bit. But because she's a forward, and she's not a particularly powerful one at that, she, you know, she's gonna get killed too quickly. And unlike Yule, who you, allows you to look at the top card of your deck, she forces you to reveal it. And the worst thing that you can do is give your opponent more informa information than they need. And that, that's a reason why I will probably not play Yuna, and I just don't, I just don't think very highly of her, to be honest. And then Yuri, on the other hand, I actually do think very highly of. I already mentioned him as part of the Crystal Chronicles engine, but by being all elements except dark, he's boosted by any power booster. So if you're playing a Wind's X deck, and you're running the X's power booster and Maria, he's going to get 2,000 power, like, regardless. Like, it doesn't matter, I mean, he's gonna get 2,000 power anyway, I've just realized because Maria boosts everybody. But you see what I mean. And I do think that he, he allows Colours that don't match up with the abilities to do things they shouldn't do. So, for example, Yuri in a mono fire deck could use his ability to dull and freeze a forward, which is unheard of in a fire deck. You can draw cards in colours like Earth or Wind, that are, or Earth or um, Lightning, that aren't very good at drawing cards. So I do think that he kind of 
has a chance to kind of, uh, to mitigate the problems that some other colours have. When I spoke about Mono Fire last week, I do I believe that you know this is a good way for this color this colour to go. And then going to the dark cards, Goldez is a value machine, uh, very similarly to how Zidane was in Opus 3. And I still, while this card is above the curve. It's dark, so it can be searched for by things like Camelot. I still think that there is an argument to be had for Zidane because all of the, the advantages you get from Zidane you get the second you play it, whereas Galdez has to go into the break zone. So who knows, maybe Water Wind will start running Yuna and Chaos Walker of the Wheel again. Um, it does still run it to some extent, but obviously with Fasoya being so popular, a lot of people will opt for the 2 CP Yuna instead of a 5. But I think that I, I like the card a lot, but I think that Dark has so many targets that uh, you know that Camelot can search for. Like Shadow Lord is very very popular at the moment, and who knows? You know, it, 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 you have to kind of wait and see where the meta goes before you can decide something like that. Because Shadow Lord's obviously only going to be really good if a lot of two CP forwards see start to see play like they are now. Whereas if you just want value, Galdez is going to do that for you. And then Sin, Sin is arguably my favourite card in the set. And it's not because of that S ability, I can tell you that right now, because I don't like that S ability. I think it's really, really gimmicky, and I don't think it's very often you're going to see it go off. But if you want to try something really crazy, play it alongside an Eldnarsh, if you, uh, you know, and a Spiritus, and then have Giga Graviton and Paradise resolve at the same time, because you choose the order in which those two things resolve, so you win before you lose. So you can do that if you really want to. But, I think the reason this card is so good is because it is dark and it is a board wipe. If you're against an earth deck and you play five forwards onto the board, chances are you're going to be frightened, uh, frightened of a Shantotto hitting the board. Now, you're not going to be able to do that against anything. I like this card as much as I do because it punishes overextending really badly and monster decks can't even get away with it anymore and I really enjoy that. I, yes, you take a point of damage, but Honestly, that's not the worst thing, and there are things you can do with that. You still get EX point, EX bursts off of it as well. It doesn't say you can't. So there is that to note as well. So you could see see this in play next to Seymour or Ephemeral Summoner. Probably Seymour because he's not going to get blown up by Sin. But I do quite. I just think that Sin has a lot of potential to see play. And again, like I mentioned with Tidus, I think the threat of him is actually stronger than he is himself. But I really, really like the what he brings to the table. So that is it for my Opus 7 highlights video. Thank you very, very much for watching. And do sound off in the comments below if there's a card that I've missed that you guys really, really love and I want to hear about it. I obviously couldn't go through every card in the set because otherwise this video would be hours and hours long. And let me know in the comments as well what decks you guys are planning on building, what decks you'd like to see a you know, deck profile for on this channel. And just let me know what you guys think of the set in general. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to check out all of my social media links and my Patreon if you would like to support this channel further. And I thank you very, very much again. I'll speak to you guys soon. See you later. Bye now.